Tonight at 10, Buckingham Palace releases more details ahead of the Queen's state funeral on Monday. The service at Westminster Abbey will start at 11 o'clock. There will then be a procession past Buckingham Palace, followed by members of the royal family. Today, Prince William told crowds at Sandringham how difficult it was walking behind his grandmother's coffin yesterday, saying it brought back memories of his own mother's funeral. The crowds keep coming to file past the Queen's coffin. The queue is now almost five miles long, a nine-hour wait to reach Westminster Hall. Also on the programme tonight, officials in Ukraine say they have discovered the bodies of around 400 people after liberating a city captured by Russian troops in April. This was a residential building, a place where civilians were living and it was ripped apart by an airstrike. The centre of the building is completely gone. The billionaire boss of the outdoor fashion brand Patagonia has given away his company. He says future profits must be used to fight climate change. Game, set and, match for and it is game, set and match for the tennis legend Roger Federer as he announces he's retiring at the age of 41. And stay with us here on BBC News, where we will bring you continuing coverage of events plus analysis from our team of correspondents in the UK and around the world. Good evening. Buckingham Palace has revealed more details about the Queen's state funeral on Monday. The service at Westminster Abbey will begin at 11 in the morning and will be followed by a national two-minute silence. Then there will be a procession through London. Prince William and Prince Harry will once again walk together behind the Queen's coffin alongside other members of the royal family. Today, Prince William told well-wishers at Sandringham how difficult walking behind his grandmother's coffin had been, saying it brought back memories of his mother Diana's funeral 25 years ago. Our Royal Correspondent Daniela Ralph reports. Viewing the carpet of flowers and tribute, the Prince and Princess of Wales came to Sandringham to say thank you to the staff, to the community who supported the Queen throughout her reign. <laughs> It was an emotional return to the Norfolk estate, a chance to chat and reflect on events of the past week. The Prince of Wales was asked about walking behind his grandmother's coffin to Westminster Hall yesterday. Doing the walk yesterday was challenging. That's yes. back to memories. Challenging. It brought back memories, he said. The sombre walk from Buckingham Palace alongside Prince Harry, a reminder of when, as a 15-year-old, he walked the same route behind his mother's coffin. The pain of past anguish still keenly felt. William spent many happy Christmases at Sandringham. It was a sanctuary for the royal family, a place they could retreat to. And every February, the Queen came to remember her father, who died at the Norfolk estate 70 years ago. But today, Sandringham remembered the Queen. I, I just said that my sincere condolences to both her and William and also to King Charles and to the royal family because I'm heartbroken that our lovely Queen's gone. Across the generations, they came to see the prince and princess. There were lighter moments too, with many filming their exchanges with William and Catherine on their phones. I love he's got his little Garsman uh, yeah. t-shirt on. Yeah. And a Paddington as well. Yeah. I was saying, I think Paddington might have knocked the corgi off the top spot. Now. <laughs> I'm not sure how they'll take the corgis, but they'll take that no, very well. Um, we spoke to William and we spoke to Kay. Um, they both um, said about his little outfits, how nice they were. Um, they're just really nice and genuine people. To say, like, thanks for the Queen, everything she's done, and all the things they're doing for everyone, it's just so nice. The Prince and Princess of Wales are key to the future of the royal family. They are the younger face of modern monarchy, but their new roles bring added pressure and scrutiny. Today was an official duty, but also a chance to share their sadness with many who viewed the royal family as neighbours. Daniela Ralph, BBC News, Sandringham. 
Well, 2,000 people will gather in Westminster Abbey on Monday morning for the final farewell to Britain's longest reigning monarch. World leaders, prime ministers past and present and foreign royals will be among those at the service, which will last an hour before the Queen's coffin is taken to Windsor, where she will be laid to rest in St George's Chapel beside the Duke of Edinburgh. Our Royal Correspondent Nicholas Witchell reports. It rests on the catafalque, a brightly lit coffin which has become the focus of a nation's sadness. Within the ancient walls of Westminster Hall, so many emotions, so many individual expressions of gratitude and respect. Thousands have already filed through. Many tens of thousands more are expected over the weekend. And as the nation mourns, preparations are advancing for Queen Elizabeth's state funeral. On Monday, the first procession will be from the Palace of Westminster to Westminster Abbey. At 10.35, the Queen's coffin will be borne from Westminster Hall. It will be taken in procession via Parliament Square and Broad Sanctuary to the West Gate of Westminster Abbey. It will arrive there at 10.52. In the darkness of the early morning, all the elements are being meticulously rehearsed. The finishing touches to plans drawn up over many years. The procession to the Abbey will be led by the massed pipes and drums of all the Scottish and Irish regiments in the British Army. And this is the most visible sign that this is to be a full state funeral, the like of which we haven't seen in Britain since Winston Churchill's in 1965. The state gun carriage will be drawn by 150 Royal Naval ratings rather than by horses. Inside Westminster Abbey will be a congregation of 2,000. Among them, heads of state, including the US President Joe Biden, with heads of government and representatives from virtually every country in the world. At approximately 11.55, the last post will sound and there will be a national two-minute silence. Then, the procession from Westminster Abbey to Wellington Arch. The state gun carriage will be drawn from the Abbey around Parliament Square, up Whitehall and across Horse Guards, and then via the Mall, past Buckingham Palace, and finally up Constitution Hill to Wellington Arch at Hyde Park Corner. There, under Wellington Arch, the coffin will be transferred from the gun carriage to the state hearse, ready for the journey to Windsor. The route to be taken from Hyde Park Corner to Windsor hasn't so far been disclosed. However, officials recognise the need for the public to be as closely involved as possible. The Queen and, and indeed other members of the royal family, particularly Prince Philip when he was alive, took a close interest in this to try and make sure that it combined the dignity of the occasion, uh, the formality of the occasion, with as much... Um, uh, access as possible uh, for, for people to see uh, the coffin at close quarters. The final element of the funeral plan will see the hearse travelling up the long walk at Windsor, then into the castle's main quadrangle and then down the slope to St George's Chapel. Inside the chapel at four o'clock the committal service will begin. At the end of it, the instruments of state, the monarch's crown and the orb and scepter, will be removed from the coffin and, later, in a private service, the Queen's coffin will be laid to rest with that of her late husband. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News. Well, the queue to file past the Queen lying in state is now stretching back 4.9 miles from Westminster Hall along the south bank of the River Thames. Our special correspondent, Lucy Manning, is with people in the queue, people who've been waiting for many hours. Lucy. Well, it's after 10 o'clock and for the second night in a row, the route is absolutely full of people. It is 
astonishing. The people around me, they have been waiting around seven and a half hours. They've got about half an hour more to go. At the back of the queue, they're saying the wait is around nine hours and it has reached its end point at Southwark Park, but Southwark Park is big. It still has capacity to take a lot more people. The destination is obviously a sombre one, but people feel that this journey has actually been very joyful. That is until they reach the steps and the silence of Westminster Hall. It's the long and winding road to Westminster Hall, stretching miles through the capital. It is glorious. The desire to pay tribute to the Queen can be measured in people standing shoulder to shoulder for nearly five miles. Some journeys even longer than just the queue here. Becky from Ayrshire took the overnight bus from Glasgow. Come into Victoria Station at um, about 10 to 7 and I've just been queuing since then, managed to get to the end of the queue and I'll get a bus back tonight. So why have you made this massive journey? I love, I do, I love the Queen and I just wanted to come down and I, she's just like your gran, I suppose, without, or, without knowing her, you feel like you do know her. <laughs> After nearly six hours, Becky was overcome by her moment by the coffin. It kind of hit you in that moment that, that that's it really. <laughs> I'm going to be emotional. That's okay. Um, but it's sad. But it's something that I'll, not, I'll, I'll never forget. Um, I'm, I'm, and I'm so glad I came here. I'm glad it, you was made well, it. it was worth the journey. Darkness didn't deter. Few see the hours here as an effort, more of an experience. Joy left Manchester at 5am, joining the queue at 9 it's absolutely amazing. The camaraderie is, um, is just something that you can't put into words unless you're in this queue. You, you actually <laughs> feel it. It's great. We're not sure how many more hours there are to go. We feel that we're near, but I think we're far. Many hours later... Spine chilling in the aura that was in there and the sheer magnificence and beauty of Her Late Majesty's coffin. But to actually be there in the here and the now I can't believe that me and my friends have done that. 17-year-old Kabir feeling the six hours of waiting and walking. Um, how long have you been queuing for till this point? Since 8.30. Right, how's it been? Long, I'm tired, but I get to see the Queen. Yeah, it's, it's like once in a lifetime moment. This is probably gonna be the last Queen. This part of the queue is opposite St Paul's, but officials will need to decide at the weekend when to close it to ensure that all those who are still in it get the chance to file past the Queen's coffin before the lying in state ends. Inside, we are witnessing simple acts of remembrance and respect. Whether you held the highest office in the land or just work in one, everyone has their moment. A salute, a tear, a kiss, night comes but the crowds do not fall away, they care about their duty, they are constant, much like the late Queen. Lucy Manning, BBC News. Well, this is the government's live page with the latest update on the queue. And as you can see, it currently says the queue is around four and a half miles, 4.9 miles long, in fact. An estimated queuing time is nine hours now. And if you can't get to London, but you want to pay your respects, the BBC is offering a continuous 24 hour view of the Queen's lying in state. The service is available on the BBC's homepage, on the BBC News website and app the iPlayer and on BBC Parliament, as well as the red button. Officials in Ukraine say they have found evidence of mass graves around the recently liberated city of Izum. More than 400 bodies are thought to be buried there. Izum, in the east of the country, was liberated by Ukrainian forces at the weekend after being captured by Russian troops back in April. It was strategically important to Russia, linking troops in the Kharkiv region with those in the Donetsk region, helping supplies get to the front line. 
Our senior international correspondent, Ola Girin, reports now from Izum. Trying to tow away unintended gifts from Moscow. Left behind after a Russian rout, now stuck in a ditch near the city of Izum. Come on, Andrew jokes, let's give it a push. Ukrainian troops savoring their victory. <laughs> a roadside reunion among brothers in arms. Super, super. This is super. Da, uh, Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is winning, he tells us. Now we feel strong. I thank Europe, especially Britain and Boris Johnson, and thanks to the United States. Without their support, I would probably be dead already. Inside Izum, Ukrainian forces now own the streets. Defeat here was a real blow for the Russians. They used this strategic city as a logistics base. Local people no longer afraid, now able to mock the enemy. Larissa unloads her bags with trepidation. She's just returned with her friend Victoria, but has no home left to go to. Our house is completely destroyed, she says. They ruined everything. All I have left are my keys and my identity documents. For months, this city was bombarded, its people cut off, their stories untold. Izum's dead are still being counted and the atrocities still coming to light. Like the Russian attack here back in March at around nine one morning. This was a residential building, a place where civilians were living, and it was ripped apart by an airstrike. The centre of the building is completely gone. And you can still see evidence of those who were living here. On the top floor, there's a television. A few floors below, there's still clothes hanging in a wardrobe. Officials here say that 47 people were killed, among them children. They weren't safe even in the shelter, where residents huddled together to keep warm. There are school books in the wreckage and smiling faces in a family album. Tatiana shows me her singed balcony. She says she had a lovely apartment and lived here for 22 years. She survived because she was in the bomb shelter at work, not the one at home. It was beautiful here. There were roses and flower beds. The building was well looked after. When I found out that almost all the neighbours had died, and some weren't even found because they were burned, I was hysterical. And I've just found out my favourite neighbours are dead too. <laughs> <laughs> Alexander is also grief-stricken over the death of his son Artur, killed on Monday by a collaborator, he says, just after the Russians were pushed out. In desperation, he's written a long account of the killing, hoping someone will help him get justice. The Russians had their main base here, their flag now consigned to the rubbish. Inside, a paper trail, though some documents were hastily torn up. Nearby, we found piles of Ukrainian passports they had confiscated. Outside the building, Ukrainian police grow suspicious of a man who was hanging around. They're still hunting for enemy agents. He's detained for questioning. Police here now say they have found evidence of a mass grave around Izum, thought to contain more than 400 people. It's unclear how they died, but exhumations are due to begin tomorrow. Orligiran, BBC News, Izum.
Well, President Putin has held talks with China's president for the first time since Russia invaded Ukraine. Xi Jinping greeted Vladimir Putin, calling him my old friend. And the Russian president thanked him for what he called China's balanced position on the war. But President Putin did acknowledge that Beijing also has concerns about Russia's invasion. Our Russia editor Steve Rosenberg is in Moscow. And how significant was that meeting and President Putin's admission, Steve? Yeah, well, for a start, the meeting itself was uh, was very significant because um, the relationship between Russia and China really came through here. And this was a rare chance for Vladimir Putin to show that despite Western sanctions, despite the West's attempt to try to isolate Russia over the invasion of Ukraine, Russia has powerful friends. Now, about this admission, it was very significant too, and very unexpected. Uh, basically, Vladimir Putin was saying, look, I understand that China has questions and concerns about the situation in Ukraine. Basically, the Kremlin leader suddenly was revealing to the world that China was anxious, China was worried about the Russian offensive in Ukraine. And that was interesting, that was new. We hadn't heard Beijing admit publicly to that. What we don't know is what happened next when the journalists left the hall, you had the closed part of the meeting. We don't know whether President Xi laid out his concerns in detail to President Putin. Neither do we know whether those concerns will give the Kremlin pause for thought. Our Russia editor in Moscow, Steve Rosenberg, thank you. Well, joining me now is our world affairs editor, John Simpson. And where does China now stand in all of this? Well, I think there's not much doubt that uh, President Xi Jinping must be quite annoyed by all of this. This, this meeting happened uh, in Samarkand in Uzbekistan, and th there were a number of international, there are a number of international leaders there, and this was to be the moment when President Xi was able to, was expecting to be able to say, look, I lead a grouping of nations which is much better and bigger and stronger than NATO, which is frankly on the back foot. That was his expectation. But of course, NATO isn't on the back foot. It's Russia that's on the back foot. Uh, there's all sorts of other problems. I mean, next week, next month, um, the Chinese Communist Party has its Congress really important for, for Xi Jinping. He's going to enter his second decade as the country's leader there. And there are, there is a, a small, but nevertheless very definite uh, sense of, of uncertainty and unhappiness among some Chinese Communist Party figures that he should be doing this. They don't, they don't want to have a, a, a party congress which is overshadowed by, by what's happened. On Monday, world leaders are going to be descending on London for the Queen's state funeral. Uh, president Putin, Russia's president, has not been invited and uh, is clearly furious about it. Yes, I mean, there's an irony here because um, uh, President Putin actually sent an amazingly gracious message about the Queen and he's the one that's not getting invited. Well, you couldn't invite him. I mean, it, it really wouldn't be right. Uh, he might be uh, open to all sorts of actions if he did come to Britain. So there's no question about that. Xi Jinping sent a much more sort of um, rather a gruff, uh, the kind of minimum that he could possibly say uh, about the Queen. Um, and. And yet he gets invited. Well, he's not actually an enemy of, of our friends. So there's no reason not to invite him. But the fact is he wouldn't come. He certainly won't come. We don't know whether some more junior figure will come. But my guess is that on Monday, uh, the uh, Chinese ambassador will be sitting in the seat that was reserved for President Xi. Our World Affairs Editor, John Simpson, thank you. Mourners have worn pink at the funeral of nine-year-old Olivia Pratt Corbell, the little girl who was shot and killed in Liverpool last month. She died after a gunman chasing another man burst into her home. Judith Moritz reports. 
Olivia Pratt Corbell's coffin was brought past her primary school to the church next door. Yards from where the little girl used to play, her community came together to say goodbye. Cheryl Corbell is still nursing the wrist injury she suffered when trying to stop the gunman who shot her daughter. Somehow she found the strength to give the eulogy. She will never be forgotten. So us and I will never say goodbye. But what I will say is good night, love you, see you in the morning. <laughs> Olivia's school displayed its own tributes to the nine-year-old. So the wishes of the family in church were that everyone wore a splash of pink. So today in school, the children are all wearing a splash of pink. We've got pink hearts in the windows. We've got ribbons on the fence. The Archbishop of Liverpool said that, like the Queen, Olivia had lived life to the fullest. Olivia's life was a life well lived, even though it's a short one, because she brought so much happiness to her immediate family. Olivia was killed when a gunman burst into her home whilst chasing another man. Merseyside police are still looking for the attacker and his weapons, this week searching a stream at a nearby golf club. So far, there have been nine arrests, but no one's been charged. Yesterday, a £50,000 reward was offered for information which leads directly to the conviction of Olivia's killer. Olivia was one of three people shot dead in Liverpool within the same week last month. Today, the city's mayor said she hoped justice would be swift and true. Judith Moritz, BBC News, Liverpool. The government is considering removing a cap on bankers' bonuses as part of a shake-up of the rules around financial services. It's understood no decisions have been taken, but sources close to the new Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, say he believes removing the limit will make London more attractive to global banks. Our business editor, Simon Jack, is here, so there's an expectation that this is going to happen. Well, no decisions taken yet, but I think it's a pretty provocative but clear statement of intent about what the Chancellor wants to do. The economic case is that if you make the UK and London in particular more attractive, you'll get more business from places like New York, from Asia, which don't have these caps on bonuses. You get more business, more economic growth and ultimately more tax. Now, that, that case is not universally accepted that it'll work. But the political case, of course, is even harder to make at a time uh, lifting the lid on bankers' pay when people are facing a cost of living crisis is going to be very controversial. It has already provoked outrage in many quarters. But it's also one of those things which is a relic of EU law, which was imported when we left the European Union. It's there to be abolished. Uh, but I don't think that many people would think that um, abolishing bankers' bonuses, bonus caps would have been top of the list of Brexit dividends, particularly for some people in, in red wall seats. And meanwhile, there's going to be a mini budget. That's what it's been called next Friday. Yeah, nothing mini about it in a way. Uh, we're expecting to see reverses of the national insurance rise. We're expecting to see a halt in rising corporation tax. That could cost between 30 and 50 billion pounds. And we'll get more detail on how they intend to help businesses cope with the energy price rises. That could cost £100 billion plus. So if you add it all together, you could get to something like £200 billion. As I say, nothing mini about it. A massive fiscal intervention in the first two weeks of this government, and it happens next Friday. Simon Jack, thank you. The billionaire founder of the outdoor fashion brand Patagonia has given away his company to a charitable trust. Yvonne Chouinard said any profit not reinvested in running the business would go to fighting climate change. The Patagonia label has amassed a cult following with outdoors enthusiasts, but even more so amongst tech industry leaders in Silicon Valley. Our North America technology reporter James Clayton has more. Patagonia sells all sorts of different outdoor equipment, but it's this, the Patagonia vest that has become iconic here in Silicon Valley. It's the uniform of the tech bro. Jeff Bezos, Apple's Tim Cook, just some of the names sporting Patagonia style vests. Patagonia has replaced the suit and tie here. Don't buy this jacket. Part of the reason for the company's success came from its eye-catching position on the environment. It even took out ads saying not to needlessly buy their products. Their clothes are supposed to be for life. So there's a particular model of capitalism called shareholder capitalism that says the only purpose of companies is to maximize shareholder value. We don't agree with that. The company's founder, a mountain climber at heart, is a passionate environmentalist. 
everything that we do as a company to be more responsible turns out to be good for the business. He's now given the company lock, stock and barrel to a charitable trust aiming to protect the environment. In a statement, he said, instead of extracting value from nature and transforming it into wealth for investors, we'll use the wealth Patagonia creates to protect the source of all wealth. But Patagonia items are expensive. This top costs 90 pounds and critics argue that it's easy to be against fast fashion when you can charge so much. The cost of doing it right, meaning that you pay attention to the whole footprint, that's how much water is used, whether dangerous dyes or chemistries are used, and reducing the carbon is a little bit more expensive. But when you actually factor that in over the whole lifetime of a garment, it isn't more expensive. California, home to Patagonia's global headquarters in recent years, has faced particular threats from climate change. Some of the state's biggest ever wildfires have taken place in the last few years, and drought is an ever-present problem. Patagonia thinks there's a way for capitalism and environmentalism to exist equitably. The company now says it wants to focus on climate change and keeping truly wild areas wild. Perhaps it's a model that other companies will follow. James Clayton, BBC News. San Francisco. Now, have a look at this. Researchers have discovered the world's oldest heart. The 380 million year old fossil was discovered in Western Australia in the gogo fish, which is one of our earliest evolutionary ancestors. The fossil captures a key moment in evolution that led to the emergence of the heart and other organs in the human body. Here's our science correspondent, Palab Ghosh. This rock contains a heart that's hundreds of millions of years old. It's from a prehistoric creature that lived long before the first dinosaurs walked the earth. The go-go fish. It's the animal humans evolved from. We were all crowded around the computer and recognised that we had a heart and pretty much couldn't believe it and then decided that it was incredibly exciting. This is a, a crucial moment in our own evolution and it shows that the body plan that we have evolved very early on and we see this for the first time. The fossil was discovered more than 10 years ago in the Kimberley region of Western Australia. In footage shot by the scientists, they record how they found the go-go fish fossils inside the small boulders scattered all across a region that was once a reef teeming with life. We've got a lower jaw there, a beautiful series of branchiostega rays, perculum, skull roof preserved up here, and beautiful articulated scales right down to the beginning of the tail. These are some of the rocks from Australia that the fish were found in. The scientists cracked them open to see what was inside. You can see a tiny specimen inside this one. Crucially, when the rocks were forming, they contain minerals that preserve their organs, such as their liver, their stomach, and most importantly, their heart. The scientists scanned the rocks to reveal the go, go fish. The heart was perfectly preserved. They discovered it had two main parts, one on top of the other. A development, published in the journal Science, that ultimately led to the human heart and other aspects of our evolution. A lot of the things we first see, we still have in our own bodies. So jaws, for example, there are teeth. We see um, some of the first appearances of not only uh, the front fins, but also the fins at the back, which eventually evolve into our arms and legs. The neck, as we've talked about, the position of the heart and the morphology and the arrangement of the heart. Scientists across the world are now looking through their fossils to investigate whether the evolution of the go-go fish's heart was a key development that eventually transformed all life on Earth. Palad Ghosh, BBC News. The former Wales rugby union player and broadcaster Eddie Butler has died at the age of 65. He was on a charity trek in Peru on the Inca Trail with his daughter when he passed away in his sleep. The final whistle. The captain, the crowd, the occasion. It has been a brilliant campaign by Wales.
Known for his commentary on Welsh games and other internationals for the BBC, he was capped 16 times by his country and toured with the British and Irish Lions to New Zealand in 1983. The BBC's Director General paid tribute to him, calling him a wonderful wordsmith who voiced some of rugby's most vital moments. Eddie Butler, who has died at the age of 65. Roger Federer, one of the most successful tennis players of our time, has announced he is retiring at the age of 41. The 20-time Grand Slam champion, among them a record eight Wimbledon titles, has been struggling with a knee problem for the last three years. Next week, he'll play his last professional match in London. Andy Swiss looks back now on an incredible career. He seemed one of sport's timeless talents. Across more than two decades and a fair few hairstyles, Roger Federer turned winning into a way of life. Game, set a match, Federer. But one of the greatest players in history is finally hanging up his racket. Since winning a record eighth Wimbledon title in 2017, Federer's struggled with a knee injury. He's not played competitively this year, posting footage of his rehabilitation online. Hopes were raised by pictures of him back on court, but he announced on social media that after one last event next week, he's retiring. I've worked hard to return to full competitive form, but I also know my body's capacities and limits, and its message to me lately has been clear. I am 41 years old. I've played more than 1,500 matches over 24 years. Tennis has treated me more generously than I ever would have dreamt, and now I must recognize when it is time to end my competitive career. His statistics are staggering. His Wimbledon crown back in 2003, the first of some 20 Grand Slam titles. But it wasn't just what he did, it was the way in which he did it. That style, that elegance, Federer made the extraordinary look effortless. Brilliance, while it seemed barely breaking sweat. I think he was one of the most uh, beautiful tennis players that I've ever witnessed on a court in terms of how he played the sport, the fluidity, the grace, the balletic sort of qualities and artistic qualities that he brought to, to the game. Perhaps Federer's greatest opponent, Rafael Nadal, also paid tribute. Dear Roger, my friend and rival, he tweeted, I wish this day would have never come. It's a sad day for me personally and for sports around the world. And so just weeks after Serena Williams announced her retirement, another legend leaves the stage. Federer's exit from Wimbledon last summer, effectively his final bow, but the achievements will never fade of one of sport's most glittering stars. Andy Swiss, BBC News. Now let's go back to the extraordinary queues along the River Thames in London tonight. These are live pictures. People who are very nearly there, they have reached Westminster, after waiting all day and here is the the security area just before they go into Westminster Hall the queue is now almost five miles long it goes right the way back beyond Tower Bridge to Southwark Park for anyone who knows that part of London it is a very long wait around nine hours or so for those who can't queue for that long disabled people or those with a long-term condition there is an accessible queuing scheme so they can still pay their respects in person our correspondent sean dilly has more the start of the journey this is where many disabled people are signing up to pay their respects to the queen so i suffer from uh, autism adhd and tourette's jenny and her family have traveled from cheshire is a visit made possible thanks to this system I'm a big royalist, so I, I really wanted so when I've seen this queue, it was like, we're coming down. Yeah. made the decision like yesterday and that was it. I'm so grateful, very, very grateful. Pam has travelled from Edinburgh to collect her wristband. It's been lovely. We didn't think we were going to be able to do it. I couldn't have n uh, done that without this help. So th this literally makes a difference? To totally, be totally. I'm yeah. thrilled to bits that we're going to be able to do it. Jenny, her daughter and retired guide dog Andy have come to pay their respects too. We were told it was going to be hours and hours, so we're very pleased to know there's this access queue, which has cut the time down hugely, I think. From here, people are given a time slot and told where to join the accessible queue. It's taken me just over 10 minutes to walk the half mile from the registration point here to the Palace of Westminster. People from both queues are entering the security points into Westminster Hall where Her Late Majesty is lying in state.
Around two hours after we first spoke, Jenny and her family have arrived at Westminster Hall. Their progress has been considerably quicker than for those who were able to stand in the main queue. For those who were unable to queue for long periods, appreciation. It was great. Yeah, it was good. It was run smoothly. It's harder for people like us. It's harder for people who are disabled to do it. So it's nice to have that option. Well, actually, it was very good, wasn't it? Out of 10, how inclusive and accessible do you think today was? Definitely 10 out of 10, as far as I'm concerned. It, yeah. it was very moving as well as we were there, you know. Yeah, there were no steps involved and no bridges, you know, things to get. So it was great, yeah, it was really good. It's a system that seems to be running smoothly so far. If it continues this way, it could allow thousands of disabled people who may otherwise miss the opportunity to pay their respects in person. Sean Dilley, BBC News. Well, let's go live now to Chichi Azundu, who has spent the day in the queue and is now, I think, on Lambeth Bridge, is that correct, near Westminster? I am indeed on Lambeth Bridge and I did indeed spend the day in the queue and I have to say one of the th most outstanding things that was notable was how much laughter there was as people egged each other on as we walked along the Thames, along bridges, pointing out landmarks. It took eight hours approximately but the official queue tracker is saying it is nine hours now and it is stretching nearly five miles back but I just want to introduce you to some people who've just got to this point in the queue. Tony, Marley and Joanne. How do you guys find it? Because you didn't know each other. No, we didn't. No, we, no, we met when we first joined the queue. And uh, how have you found walking alongside each other? Oh, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. The banter's been great. Uh, very friendly. And so you've got to this point. How's it been? How many hours have you done so far? Uh, just over five hours to get here. And it, it hasn't felt like five hours been quite quick. It felt quick, yes. Joanne, I'm going to get you to speak up over the sirens whizzing past us. How have you found it? Because, just to explain, you are Canadian, but you live in West Yorkshire. Yes, um, I've lived here for quite a few years, but I wanted to come down, and the um, crowd has been really pleasant to walk alongside. Um, we've had different paces set, we've had different stops, we've been able to speak to different people and meet new people and have a really good chats along the way. Because you came down by yourself, are you glad that you found a group to do the emotional part with? Yes, we met at the very beginning I and mean, along with a couple of other people it's just been nice to have a little group to go through with. Fantastic. Tony, let's talk about your medals, yeah. because you're wearing them proudly. I am, yes. Let, where, what are they? Uh, General Service Medal, uh, United Nations Medal, the Jubilee Medal and Long Service and Good Conduct Medal. And why did you feel it was important to wear them displayed? Um, just to honour Her Majesty. Um, she was my uh, Commander-in-Chief and I've, you know, I thought it was right to wear them and uh, say farewell to her. The question that everyone's asking at this point in the in the journey is, have you thought about the actual entering of the Westminster Hall and how you might feel? Yeah, I think it'd be very uh, emotional, I think. Um, yes, just very emotional. I think we've had a lot of laughs on the way, but I think they're starting to calm down now. I think it will be a very reflective time and um, I'm very much looking forward to being able to pay my respects. Well, guys, thank you so much for stepping out of the queue. I know you've got a little bit longer to go because I think there's about two more hours of, of walking, I'm afraid. The good news is, is that weather-wise, it's not going to be too cold, but people are telling us they're still coming prepared with warm gear and some drinks and food to keep them going. Chi Chi Azunda, thank you very much. Well, let's go inside Westminster Hall now and live pictures there as thousands of people continue to file past the Queen's coffin. Uh, it's the moment that they have all been waiting for. On top of the Queen's coffin is a wreath that has been made up of flowers from her gardens in Balmoral and Windsor. The Queen loved her gardens. She was patron of the Royal Horticultural Society for 70 years and she loved the Chelsea Flower Show. <laughs> David Bowes-Lyon, the Queen's uncle, escorted her on her preview of the Chelsea Flower Show. 
The Queen visited the Chelsea Flower Show more than 50 times. She only missed a handful of shows during her long reign. It was one of her favourite fixtures in the calendar and one that she often took the whole family to. Chelsea was also one of the Queen's last big public appearances in May. She was able to move around the showground thanks to her new buggy and she clearly enjoyed it. She seemed incredibly uh, animated. I suppose what the buggy created is it's a slightly different environment because normally when people visit places uh, you have people jostling around and people being moved on and back etc. But we had the sort of the privilege of sitting side by side and just stopping and starting the buggy which meant that she was very easily guided around uh, the whole Chelsea Flower Show. And then the bees turn up as you can see they've, they've all just turned up. We haven't hired them in for the day. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't bring them with you? They didn't bring them with us. Raymond Everson is a renowned clematis grower from Guernsey. The Queen would make a beeline for him year after year. I spoke with Her Majesty and, and she said, well, clematis really won't go at Balmoral. And I said, ma'am, with respect, I'm sure they will. And so spoke with the head gardener and uh, spent some time walking with the Queen, just the two of us. Uh, that, that, was, that was just magical. I, I met the, the regal Queen and I also met this very most wonderful lady who and we were could be very relaxed and, and chatting and you know I felt sort of elevated somehow or other and it, but it was just a, a wonderful feeling just being with Her Majesty. And on the Queen's final visit to Chelsea this year she made public his royal role. And we wouldn't have any clematis for him. I promised the Queen that I would go to Balmoral to see how the clematis were and I, I will go back in, in October to Balmoral and uh, take a, a collection of some of our newer clematis for the gardens too. So the clematis will, will live on? Absolutely. The wonderful Raymond Everson who brought clematis to Balmoral for the Queen. Time now for a look at the weather. Simon King is here now. Let's uh, think about these people who are queuing out all night. Nine hours is the... Uh the time they're going to have to wait at the moment. What's the weather going to be like? How cold is it going to get? Well, this is it. I mean, it's going to be dry at least, but the big thing I think over the next couple of days is how cold it will get because actually into Saturday morning it could be the coldest we've had it in the UK since kind of late May. So that is a real consideration for anybody who is going to be joining the queue over the next couple of nights. Now, for today, we had some sunny spells again, and actually temperatures in that September sunshine got up to about 21 degrees Celsius. Now, tomorrow... And the next day, it's going to be cooler. And if we don't get to 20 degrees tomorrow, that'd be the first time since early June. So just an indication of how much cooler it's going to get. Now, through tonight, still some showers affecting the far north of Scotland, down the eastern side of England. One or two of those showers coming into North Wales as well. Otherwise, though, clear skies. And it's those clear skies that allow temperatures to drop down to maybe three or four degrees in northern parts of England. Still about 11 degrees Celsius in the capital through this evening. But tomorrow starts off largely fine and sunny and we'll keep that sunshine into the afternoon, especially the further west you are. Still some showers coming into Wales through the Irish Sea, showers also in across northern Scotland. But a rather brisk northwesterly wind and look at this down the eastern side of the UK. Those temperatures feeling a really fresh 12 to 14 degrees Celsius. That really will be noticeable. But the further west you are, the winds will be lighter and in that September sunshine, Still feeling fairly pleasant, 17 or 18 degrees, despite the fact, as I mentioned, we won't get to 20 Celsius. Now, there's a possibility of a shower or two on Friday in London if you are going to be joining the queue. But otherwise, the weather is set fair, really. It's just overnight. As I mentioned, those temperatures will be dropping away. And the reason? Well, it's this colder Arctic air that's been moving its way southward across the UK, more so into the early part of Saturday morning. So it's Friday night and into Saturday where temperatures could be as low as one or two Celsius in central parts of England. Potential for an isolated grass frost. But you can see for many of us, a much colder night with those temperatures down in single figures. But again, after that chilly start on Saturday, there will be lots of sunshine again. Fewer showers perhaps down the eastern side of the UK. One or two brushing in towards East Anglia. Still quite breezy conditions here as well. So again, feeling quite chilly. But again, for most of us on Saturday, the weather remains fair with that sunshine. Now it's high pressure that's moving and that's what's bringing us that settled weather. So into Sunday, 
bank holiday Monday, of course, as well. That high pressure moves its way a bit further eastward. Now, the isobars around uh, the North Sea will become a little bit further away from each other. So that means there'll be lighter winds, and that means it's not going to feel quite as raw down that eastern coast over the next couple of days. But as you can see from the outlook here, possibility of a few showers in Northern Ireland into Sunday. For most of us again on Sunday, it's going to be dry, perhaps a bit more cloud around compared to Saturday. By Bank Holiday Monday and the Queen's State funeral, again, lots of dry weather around. Temperatures about 13 degrees in the north to 17 in the south. And really the weather remains fair even as we go into next week. Simon, thank you very much. That's it from us. The news continues here on BBC One as we join our colleagues across the nations and regions for the news where you are. Good night.